to class for today. We've got some extra time. It's the same handout as last week, but I'm really excited because with the extra time, I'm going to throw in some stuff that's not in the handout. That's just some extra papal material. Pope, of course, comes from the Greek word papas, the Latin papa, which means father. He's the holy father. And uh, if you got my email, this is like a threefer for Father's Day. You get to be here as uh, in honor of your father or as a father. You get to be here in honor of your heavenly father. And we're studying the Pope the Catholic Father. So this is like a threefer, and as I tell my children, we commence Father's Day week today. <laughs> and it's a real joy for y'all to be here on this, the first day of Father's Day week. <laughs> now, with all of that, have you seen the headlines this week? The Pope has issued a cyclical on climate change. And if you look at it, it's really, really thick with a whole lot of references. And it made big news, and that's not surprising because out of the seven and a half billion people in the world, over one billion are Catholic. If you were not here last week, I took a poll by a show of hands. And here was my question. How many of you are either Catholic or at some point in your life have been Catholic or have a significant family member who is Catholic? And I think 75% of the hands went up in here. So this is a very appropriate topic for us to look at because it's one that's very relevant. And when you see these headlines, I, I, am, I am not Roman Catholic. Um, uh, I have, have never in my life been a member of the Roman Catholic Church. I have a lot of very dear friends who are, but my immediate family, not Roman. We are as Protestant as the day is long. And, and it's been interesting to grow up with that because it, it, it provides a different perspective in some ways about Catholicism and about the Pope. And I may have told you last week that when I emailed out the lesson, one of my dear friends, who John Michael Talbot, who is a, a, a Franciscan monk, third order Franciscan in the Catholic Church, he emailed me back and he said, you know, that was a good treatment of the, the Pope and the papistry for a Protestant. <laughs> Which was actually a compliment because uh, he has no trouble uh, telling me when I did not do it right, uh, which is what a good friend can do. Uh, the worldwide importance of the Pope, though, cannot be understated. It is very significant, and so I want us to talk about it with one of his titles. The Pope carries the title, quote, successor of the chief of the apostles. And we went into that in detail last week, specifically dividing it up and looking at it in two ways. Is the Pope, in fact, the successor, which in a historical sense he, he is? I mean, we are able to trace back from Pope Francis through Pope Benedict through John Paul II. You can go all the way back. And while there's a little bit of question as to whether Cletus and Anacletus are two popes or one are the same pope, you can tie back the bishop of the Roman church all the way back to the time of Peter. So there's a historical sense that the pope is the successor. There is still that Protestant issue of where there's a disagreement as to whether even Peter was the chief of the apostles or whether all of the apostles were, were the apostles. And so all of that we dealt with last week. But some of the key questions that come up as we look at this today, we have questions of whether or not the Pope is infallible. And we talk about, you know, I can't, you know I'm, I'm, this is the Protestant in me. I can't do that infallibility of the Pope stuff. I have trouble with that. We have question, is he the boss of me? If, if he's the successor, and the, is he the boss of me? We have questions, 
What about those really bad popes? There were some popes in history that were horrible. I mean, they, they were philanderers, parenting children out of wedlock, uh, thieving, conspiracies, all of the rest of this stuff. Now, I want to say a couple of things here before we get to address these issues. Number one, don't look too hard at almost any mainline Protestant church because you're going to find pastors of those churches in different places who are not really good examples either. And you're going to find them that aren't really infallible. And you're going to find them where you want to say, is he the boss of me? Or sometimes, in some denominations, is she the boss of me? So let's look at these things together. But the root answers to these questions are firmly found in church history. And so I'd really like to unfold the church history today with an eye towards better understanding these questions. I think as Protestants and sometimes as Catholics, we approach these questions based more on what as a lawyer I would say is hearsay than actual first-hand data. So let's look at it, let's be fair, let's be historical. Let's dig into it, if we might. So we dig in and we start here. Rome in its heyday was an amazing city. Maybe the most amazing city of antiquity. So many of the ruins are still here today. But we know historically that Peter made it to Rome. Whoops, go back, go back. Peter made it to Rome where he was martyred under the emperor Nero, the same emperor that martyred Paul. Peter seemed to have written his epistle from Rome. Church history teaches that Peter was at Rome. And there's not really much dispute. I don't know any credible historian who disputes that issue. Peter was in Rome. Peter was martyred in Rome under Nero. Now, was Peter the head of the church at Rome? That is set forward in church history. We don't have that in the Bible. But church history teaches that he was. He certainly, when he was in Rome as an apostle, would have had a great measure of apostleship and, and uh, uh, credibility because of that. Rome itself then is built up and Rome is going well. And then we have what's called in Scripture, hold on one sec, my computer's off, the Council of Rome. Once we close the pages of the Bible, and we're looking only at church history, we can readily see that some people went to Rome and asked for their counsel as a leading church. And so as they go to Rome and ask for that counsel, we have, for example, Clement. First Clement is a letter we studied in this class. You might recall the song Clementine. Clement, First Clement, is a letter written by the church at Rome to the church at Corinth. And it was written around the time of the book of Revelation, at the end of the New Testament. The church at Corinth had a problem with the young guys basically taking over for the old guys and kicking the old guys out of office. And the church at Rome wrote a letter saying, stop it, get in line and behave. And so it's very clear that the Rome church felt comfortable writing that letter to the Corinthian church. I might also say, however, that we have other churches also writing letters to upbraid, to uh, uh, correct, to, to uh, uh, edify other churches. So it's not unique that the Roman church did it, but the Roman church did do it. You can look at Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna in Turkey. 
And in the 120s, 130s, Polycarp goes to Rome to discuss with the, the Pope, what we later call Pope, he wasn't called Pope at the time, the Bishop of Rome, Anacletus, and he goes there to discuss with him, not Anacletus, I forgot who it was, it was uh, some Pope, <laughs> goes there to discuss how to properly figure out when Easter is. Now, that may seem small to you, but there were big church splits over how to figure out when Easter is. Do you do it off the Roman calendar? Do you do it off the Jewish calendar? Does Easter have to fall on a Sunday? Or if the Jewish calendar doesn't dictate Sunday, can it fall when it's supposed to? And there are huge, huge fights in the church over this issue. Polycarp goes to Rome, wants the Pope's council on it the Bishop of Rome's council. The Bishop of Rome responds and says something different than Polycarp believes. Polycarp and the Bishop of Rome agree to disagree and Polycarp goes back. So Polycarp went and asked and discussed with the Bishop of Rome the opinion, they had the discussion, but Polycarp had no trouble walking away saying, I think he's wrong, I think I'm right. So this is, is one where you look at it and you've got both sides of the issue there. Over the 200s and 300s and into the 400s, there were a number of synods where the various leaders of the various churches would come together and they would discuss what does the deity of Christ mean? How can God be three and one? How is Christ human? How is Christ divine? What should be the scriptures? These synods were sometimes ones where they weren't even... They, in some, the Bishop of Rome played a big role. In some, the Bishop of Rome did not. But the synods began to start happening in church history, and in the process, different churches and different bishops seemed to be taking bigger roles of authority. Now, I want to talk about the ripple effect of Constantine, but before we do it, we've got to go to the Elmo for a moment. And I want to explain an idea here. In the very early church, you've got a, a church that happens in Ephesus. Uh, let's see if we can make that a little better. You've got a church that arises in Ephesus, and it's got a few folks in it. Doesn't have too many. You've got a church that arises uh, uh, in Philippi. And it's got some folks in it. And they meet in some houses and life is good. You've got a church, of course, in Jerusalem. Now, it's a pretty big church. The Jerusalem church has got a lot of people in it. So you've, you've just got people all over the place there. I mean, it's, it's big, okay? Those churches in and of themselves are doing fine. They're just small little things, and this is our New Testament. But after a while, those churches start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you get more and more churches that come up. And pretty soon, you've got lots of churches around. And as you get lots of churches around, there needs to be some extra structure. How do those churches get along? I dare say the first day that Champion Forest Baptist Church opened its doors. I think it met in a home before they got a, a school to meet in. But I'll guarantee you the staff was nowhere the size the staff is today. There wasn't a need. The staff is what it is today because of the need. Now we've got multi-campuses and we try to figure out how to integrate them and put them together. The New Testament church was growing, growing fast, growing large. And as a result, you've got uh, uh, um, questions of how do you structure things so that things can get done. Now if we go back to the PowerPoint, Constantine in the 300s, conquers the Roman Empire and becomes the Roman emperor, but does so 
basically grabbing hold of the church because the church was the one biggest united group of people around the, the Roman Empire itself. The empire was fragmented, but through the people of God, Constantine finds a united body and he's able to put together a united church. Now here's the problem though. Constantine ultimately doesn't want to rule from Rome anymore. He wants to rule from his new city named after him, Constantinople. Constantinople. So he's got to leave some power in Rome. A loyal power in Rome. So Constantine's able to declare and ultimately uh, uh, it's, it's codified that the church is the official religion of the Roman Empire. Constantine takes the Lateran Palace and some other key properties in Rome, gives them to the church in Rome. It says build your buildings, puts the legal, I mean the, the government building teams onto the projects, funds the construction of churches, and the church at Rome starts taking on very important powers as Constantine is over in Constantinople and the church itself is seen as part of his governing arm. The church now has a legal power as well as a spiritual power. And as time unfolds, the church itself becomes over the rulers in that part of the world. And they are only accepted as rulers if they are given that power by the church. So the church has a growth in power. The church has a growth in property. The, growth, the church has a growth in governing people. It's really hard for us in 21st century America to wrap our brains around what the world was like then. How many of you have... Well, I won't say hit 65. <laughs> How many of you at some point in your life plan on hitting 65 and drawing Social Security? Medicare! Okay. Those are inventions of the U.S. government and President Roosevelt. They did not exist before then. In the Roman world, you did not hit age 65 and retire. In the Roman world, you did not have social security to draw on. In the Roman world, you did not have Medicare benefits. And the church took care of its own. The church had programs for widows who were left desolate and they would make sure they were fed and they would make sure they were housed. If someone died, the church provided a funeral. If someone needed something, the church stepped in to help. The church did it in a guarded, responsible way. Even Paul would say, hey, if somebody can work, don't just give it to them, make them work for it. But the church, there you go, Miss Carolyn. <laughs> a fan of Paul, right down here, Miss Carolyn. Um, so, so, but, but the church took care of the church. And the decision makers in the process of that, you need some. If you've got thousands upon thousands of people, how do you decide who to take care of? How do you decide who should be working? How do you decide who the widow is, that she's getting treatment right and all the rest? All of that causes a need for church structure and hierarchy. And the ultimate overseer of that from the Roman church was the bishop. He held the top seat. So he's got not only an immense amount of, of power and property, but he's got an immense amount of governing responsibility. And in our minds, we look at one of our principal overseers or bishops, to use the biblical and uh, 
English words, and that would be Pastor David, Pastor Stephen. We look at them and we see people who are preaching the Word of God. But if we came on Tuesday, you would see these men leading senior staff in their staff meetings. And I've tried on Tuesday to get them to do the other things. I've tried to get Pastor David to go with me to New York to see something that's incredible that I had to go see. I said, Pastor David, we'd leave Tuesday morning. We'd be back Wednesday morning. You'd be here in plenty of time for Wednesday night church. And he'd say, you're killing me, man. I said, no, no, no. This is it. We need to go to this Yankees baseball game. <laughs> he says, I got senior staff meeting. Well, can't you send someone else to do that for you? No, it's my job. Because every Tuesday he's got senior staff meeting. Because he's got to oversee... We have charged him, God has charged him with the responsibility to oversee. And so he oversees, the next layer oversees, the next layer oversees, and ultimately we get to come in here on Sunday morning and all of the chairs are already put out. And we didn't do it ourselves. And the air conditioner is working and someone paid the light bill say, well, we did that. We put money in the plate. There's a difference between those two. My wife can tell you, there was a time where I was in charge of paying the bills. And there was a time where the lights went off. And it's not because there wasn't money in the bank account. And it's not because I didn't make money. I didn't pay the bill. I just kind of forgot. It's the old, oops. So all of that structure that goes on, we don't typically see, and we think of the leader of the church as the man who's in the pulpit preaching. But that's our 21st century mentality. So sometimes there have been historical popes who weren't any more preachers. Some of them weren't all that godly of men. Some of them were put there to be administrators. Because they, you know, we look at it now in our historical lens and we see it as the spiritual leader. But there was a time where the pope was first and foremost a governor. So anyway, into this picture enter Pope Leo I. Pope Leo I is Pope around, he reigns from 440 to 461 as Pope. I don't know if you use the word reign. You sit as a Pope. He sits on the Holy See. From the Latin sedus, which means chair. He sits in the chair of the, the Bishop of Rome. Um, so Pope Leo is the Pope when the western part of the Roman Empire is really crumbling. It's breaking up. It's a fragment of what it used to be. The Vandals are at the city gates, and after the Vandals come the Huns. Pope Leo goes out to meet Attila the Hun, and he says to Attila, Hey, can you leave my city alone? And convinces Attila not to invade Rome itself. And Attila kind of goes his own way and go does his honey-do list. And Pope Leo has salvaged that area. But it's a classic example of, of the Bishop of Rome having responsibilities beyond simply being a preacher. He's taking care of the land. He's taking care of the properties. At this point, he's been given a lot of properties that have been given to him, not just by Constantine, but by many others. By given to him, not in the sense of a person owning it, but in the sense of the church itself owning it. And he oversees the church. Emperor Valentino III, 
And by the way, I changed my picture of Rome because Rome is in shambles at this point. But Emperor Valentino III gave Pope Leo I, also called Leo the Great, first pope to be called great, Pope Leo I, primacy over the West. Bless you. That means he's saying that you, you look, I'm going to stay over here in the East where we've got a little bit more peace. But you are in charge of the West. It's your baby. Go for it. Try to keep everything peaceful. And the Pope has armies. And the Pope has authority and power and responsibility and oversees properties. And Leo fashions the, the, the papacy in a way that we sort of see it today. And he adds to it this concept of Roman inheritance laws. Here's what he says. He says, the Pope, as Pope, I have inherited the responsibilities of my office from my predecessor. Who inherited them from his predecessor? From his, from his, from his. And Pope Leo's only idea of inheritance are those Roman inheritance laws. He has not even lived in the 21st century yet. So he is a product of his era. And as a product of his era, for centuries, when someone dies, there are Roman inheritance laws and they govern what happens. So once Pope Leo would die, his successor would be chosen by the church, but they would inherit his responsibilities. Now even at the time of Pope Leo, he recognized there had been bad popes. And he was quick to say, I can't, no one's going to inherit my heart. No one's going to inherit my spirit, my convictions, not even my knowledge or my passion, my faith. They will inherit my responsibilities. And sometimes they will discharge their responsibilities well. Sometimes they will not. Sometimes they will discharge them in faith. Sometimes they will not. But it is theirs to discharge whether they do it right or not. And that's what Leo forms and that's what Leo says. Now over time, you know what I failed to do? We need to take a time out. Let's go back for a moment and let's talk about Let's talk about this, because we need to talk about it biblically for a moment. As opposed to Roman inheritance laws, if we go back and we look at the New Testament church, so let's start, we're going to draw a New Testament church here. You may not know it, but that's what they looked like, just like that. And the New Testament church had all peoples from all lands in it, so we're going to have multiple colors of people in our church. And I know you're saying, well, who are the purple people? <laughs> Barney. <laughs> so here we've got a New Testament church. And we can ask this question of this New Testament church. Who is in charge? Now, even that question raises the hackles of some people in this room. I promise you it does. Because we live in democracy America. We live after the American Revolution, after the French Revolution. Viva la France, viva the people. And, and we say, well, we're in charge. It's a government of the people, by the people, for the people. That's a foreign mentality in history. That mentality wasn't really there early going. It was not the way of government and the world. So we can look at Scripture now, and we can see in Scripture who's in charge. And I want us to look at a couple of Scriptures. We're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. We're going to look at chapter 5, verse 17. And we're going to see a couple of words there 
that are very important for us to know. And I can't wait till we get to Greek because we're really going to have fun then. But look right now at what Paul says here. And I'll come back to that in a moment, but let's see if we can't zoom down into this. Look what Paul says. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. An overseer needs to be above reproach. Husband of one wife, sorry polygamist, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, needs to manage his own household well with dignity, keeping his children submissive. If you can't handle your own household, how will you care for God's church? Shouldn't be a recent convert. Or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Needs to be thought well of by outsiders so that he might not fall into disgrace. Look at the next passage. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified. And he goes on to talk about what deacons need to be. And then as we get over to 5.17, we've got a whole other word. So we've got L, uh, overseers and deacons so far. And then 5.17 we read... Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So we've got three words that Paul's using here. Let's go back to, let's see if we can make this back to here. We've got three words Paul is using. Okay, good. We're there. Um, word number one, overseer. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he aspires a noble thing. Overseer becomes also the word we in English now have as, so a.k.a. bishop. All right? The Greek word for bishop is episcopace. Yeah, you get Episcopalian from it. Okay? So it's episcopace. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, where's my bookmark? I want to see these letters. It's there. Episcopace. And that's our S at the end of the word. And you'll figure out the breathing. We'll talk about that later. But episcopace. So episcopace means someone, scopos, like that's the other end of microscope. It means to see. Someone who sees epi, over. An overseer. An episcopos. So Paul talks about a bishop as an episcopos. But I would suggest to you in the New Testament church, that is the same thing as when he uses the word elder. Though the word elder is presbuteros in the Greek. P-R-E-S in the middle of the word, so you use it that way. B-U-T-E-R-O-S at the end of the word. Presbuteros. All right? So a presbuteros is an elder, and then we have a deacon. And we did real good with that one. We basically co-opted the Greek word to make deacon. It's diakonos. All right? So that's a deacon. So in the Greek, elder and overseer are the same things. And there seem to be many of them at the church. So you can look at passages. You say, how do you know they're the same thing? Well, we can see it in a couple of places. In Acts 20... Verses 17 and 28, it's a very easy place to see that that's what Paul does. Acts 20, if you're turning there, or if not, I'll turn for you. Paul has just gotten to F F F uh, Miletus, and he wants to say bye to the church at Ephesus and the elders. So in verse 17, now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church, the presbuteros. We get Presbyterian from it, by the way. So he called the elders of the church to come to him, and when they came to them, he said, blah, 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 blah. I don't mean that in a 
bad way. I mean, just he says all of these things. But as you go down what you he says, look at verse 28. He's still talking to him when he says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The elders are overseers. The Presbyterians are Episcopalians. No, I mean the Presbyteros are Episcopes. So you've got the elders and the overseers, the bishops, are the same thing. You see it also in Titus. Uh, uh, and how am I doing time-wise? Okay, in Titus you see it. Titus uh, 1, verses 5 through 7. Titus and Philemon... Hold on. Titus 1. Look at this. Paul says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone's above reproach, husband of one wife, children are believers, not open to the charge of debauchery, insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. See, elder and overseer, those are the same thing in Paul's vocabulary. So they're being set up the same. This is 50, 60 A.D., all right? So as of 50, 60 A.D., what we've got here is basically the same thing. So this is in the times of the Bible, Holy Bible. Now, fast forward. If we fast forward in time to back out just a little bit more and grab a little more screen. If we fast forward in time to 105 A.D. By 105 A.D., let's see, we'll make this one about 60 A.D. So by 105 A.D., all of a sudden, there is a difference between these two. You actually have three different titles and three different jobs. You have an overseer or bishop, and it looks like at this point there's one of them in each church. And then you have elders, plural, and then you have deacons, plural. And we get this, for example, from Ignatius, who wrote about 105 A.D. And he was the one who was going off to be martyred in Rome, if you recall that lesson, if you were here that Sunday. And he wrote letters to seven churches. And the church at Tralia, he wrote a letter. And here's the third chapter of that letter, the first verse. Look what it says. So too, let everyone respect the deacons like Jesus Christ and also the bishop who is the image of the Father and let them respect the presbyters or elders like the council of God and the band of the apostles. Apart from these, a gathering cannot be called a church. So you see, by 105, you've got, and if you were wanted to look at it on the Greek side, don't, don't laugh, you're going to get good at this. You've got diakon, that's the deacon. You've got episkopon, that's the, yeah, that's your overseer, your bishop. And you've got presbyterus, which is your presbyterian, I mean, not your presbyterian, your uh, uh uh, elders, thank you. Um, so you've got those. Without those, you don't have an ecclesia, a church, ecclesia. And so uh, by 105, you've got these different jobs. And it's that bishop role that is handed down in the Church of Rome all the way up to the fellow that's sitting there today, Pope Francis. Now, if we go back to the PowerPoint. Over time, the popes were sometimes wicked, sometimes powerful, 
there were arguments about whether or not when the Pope spoke for the church, was the Pope infallible? And some people would say yes and argue that he was. And some people would say no and argue that he wasn't. And there was no official pronouncement of the church on that issue. The church did by and large recognize that when a church synod met, properly convened, that properly weighed the authority of God, that the church could rely upon what that synod said as being authoritative. Hence, the synod that says, the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God the Father. Hence, the synod that says, these are the books of the Bible. Hence, the synod that said, Jesus was fully God and fully man, who espoused the doctrine of the Trinity. But, that doesn't mean everybody says that those are without fault. And the classic Protestant question is, I want to weigh it by Scripture. And I want to see if Scripture backs it up. And that came out of, of look, look the, I put a map up here. This is Europe as of about 1050 A.D. You'll see the Holy Roman Empire, which is modern Germany, Austria, right in Switzerland, that area. You'll see France. You've got some Christians in Spain, but a lot of Muslims in Spain. You've got um, Poland, Hungary, Croatia. You've got the kingdom of Alba, north of England. But if you look down on the boot of Italy, you'll see black in the middle. Those are called papal states. They were controlled. That, that was still Rome's property. That was the property of the church. And the Roman uh, uh, bishop was the overseer of those properties. Italy did not form as a country until the 1800s. Italy was divided up. The Pope had his papal lands. And only as those were invaded and Italy consolidated into a nation did the Pope lose his papal lands and instead of fleeing, he just holed up inside the Vatican on Vatican Hill. In 1870. And that is when, in the midst of all of those political pressures, the church came out with the pronouncement that when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, cathedra meaning out of the seat, speaks on behalf, of the church as the papal voice only when he speaks ex cathedra but when he speaks ex cathedra what he says is the word of the church what we now call papal infallibility that's been done I think a handful of times since 1870 a recent pope said uh, uh, don't ask me to speak infallibly I'll do that when I'm infallible, which means I'll never do that. And we Protestants tend to think that, oh, the Pope spoke on gl climate change. Well, that must be, uh, 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 you know, that, that's, that's got to be infallible. If, if, and who's going to believe that's infallible? And da-da-da-da-da-da. No, that's not infallible. He doesn't claim infallibility on that. He claims leadership of the church. But he doesn't claim infallibility. So infallibility as a papal claim only comes up after 1870 at Vatican I. And a lot of scholars think that it was a part of an effort to try and give the Pope some power as he lost all of his lands. He held up inside the Vatican and it wasn't until Benito Mussolini cut a deal with the church where Mussolini gave over 95 million lira and said, we'll carve out this hundred acres of Vatican Hill and this will be church property. We'll restore that as the papal estates. But the rest of it, Italy's absorbed. So until that point in time, the Pope himself 
it's been an interesting historical read to see that the Pope was responsible for a whole lot more than just being a spiritual leader. He was in charge of lands, and, and I got to tell you, there are a bunch of wicked popes. There were a bunch of really good popes. But the Pope himself, we tend to see differently, perhaps, than history actually shows it. Here are your fruit for home. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father's the vine dresser, and every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. I read a passage like that and I think about my role in church and I think about what I do here and I think about uh, uh, the church at large and my brain is not so much geared toward the Pope, the Bishop, the Cardinals or any of the other offices. Mine is geared toward my walk here because I know that I want to bear fruit for the Father. And that's a charge and a responsibility that Jesus gave us individually. And I have that accountability before God my Father. And I have it whether I'm worshiping here, whether I'm at work, or whether I'm worshiping down the street as a personal responsibility to the Lord. And I'm going to try to live it. Then Jesus said this, I don't ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me, that through their word... They may all be one. If you were in church this morning and heard Pastor Fleming speak out to what went on in Charleston and how that was part of us, the AME in that church name, Emmanuel AME, African Methodist Episcopal is what that stands for. It's not a Southern Baptist church. But Pastor David recognizes where there is a believer in Christ, there is a member of the church that is Christ. And Pastor David marvelously calls us to account for that because while I have a one-on-one -on -one responsibility to bear fruit for the Lord, I also want to see Jesus' prayer fulfilled. I have a responsibility of showing the world that we are one. And I need to seek that unity among the body of Christ. And Jesus goes on to say in that prayer to God, The glory you've given me, I've given to them, us, that we may be one just as God is. And in this way, the world will know that God sent Jesus. I mean, that's pretty incredible. Jesus is directly saying how we treat each other and how we treat brothers and sisters in the Lord, wherever they be found, whatever continent, whatever color, whatever name is on their building, if they are believers and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then our unity will affirm our Lord to the world. And we need to reach out and we need to be people who do exactly like Pastor David led us in this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, this whole history thing is just amazing to me. I'm amazed at the way your hand is navigated through people, through mistakes, through human selfishness and pride, through historical circumstance, through governments and wars. For over 2,000 years, Lord, since Jesus' birth, we have seen your hand guide the bride of Christ to where we are today. And Father, we know one day you will collect us and bring us home. And we look forward to that day. But until that day, Lord, help us to really use our time and our energy for your kingdom. And I pray that even the world around us, even the city of Houston, We'll get a glimpse of who you are by the way we treat each other and the way we value 
your church. We do pray your blessings on the people in Charleston that are hurting. Lord, on the people in China and North Korea that are hurting, on the people in the Middle East that are hurting, your church is crying out. And we cry out with them until you come and make things right. Through Jesus our Lord, amen.